Longitudinal and transverse are two types of wave. Give an example of a longitudinal wave. Well, of course, the best one is sound waves, but you can also have P waves uh, from earthquakes. Describe how a longitudinal wave travels through the air. Remember, a longitudinal wave oscillates parallel to direction in which the wave is traveling or in which the energy is transferred. And that's the best definition. The particles oscillate, vibrate parallel to the direction in which the wave travels. Energy is transferred. Figure one shows a transverse wave. When you see a sketch like this, always look at the units to start with. We've got centimeters of displacement and we've got seconds for time. And it says, give the frequency of the wave. So by just giving one mark and say, give the frequency, it doesn't need a complicated calculation. So you've got to use figure one to do this. And of course, frequency is the number of oscillations or number of cycles per second. And you can see that it takes 0.5 seconds for the wave to do one cycle. So that's the period. And of course, therefore, it will do two cycles in one second. So the frequency is two hertz. So which diagram shows two points that are in phase? Well, the first thing to think about is the wave, if it's moving that way. This point is going to be going up, and this point, if you get this part of the wave coming up, is going to be moving down. They're out of phase by 180 degrees. These two points you can see clearly as the wave moves this way, that point's going to move up and that point's going to move up. And they've both got the same displacement. So they'll both move up together and down together. So it is B. And the key thing is, for points to be in phase, they must be a whole wavelength apart, which these ones are. You can see that's a whole wavelength. So the answer is B. State one type of electromagnetic wave used in satellite communications. I would always put microwaves because they can penetrate the ionosphere and get up to the high satellites. The Mark scheme would also allow radio waves, but they only get to low orbiting satellites. Television remote controls use infrared radiation to send information. Explain one advantage of using infrared radiation to control a television. Now, remember when you are looking at either Bluetooth, Wi-Fi or infrared, one of the key things is their frequencies and how much data they can transmit every second. And remember, infrared has the highest frequency of any of the three. So the advantage that I would state is that it has a high frequency so it can transmit m more data per second because of the large bandwidth. It has a higher frequency, larger bandwidth, so it can transfer more data per second. You might want to write a larger amount rather than more. Explain one disadvantage of using infrared radiation to control a television. Well, the key one is, of course, we know infrared needs line of sight. It will not pass through a wall. So you couldn't control your television from another room. Also, bright sunlight can cause interference with infrared, so it'd be more difficult to use a television in bright sunlight. However, I would use the line of sight argument. Needs line of sight, so cannot be controlled from another room. A doctor uses an endoscope to view the lining of patient's stomach, as shown in figure three. An endoscope contains optical fibers. Light travels down the optical fibers to illuminate the stomach. Explain how light travels back through the endoscope so an image of the lining of the patient's stomach can be seen. You may use diagrams to support your answer. So this is worth four marks. 
Whenever you have total internal reflection, the key things are that it totally internal reflects because the angle of instance is greater than the critical angle. Also, you can talk about the bundles having to be coherent. They have to be parallel and in the same orientation at the bottom, at the top, because each fiber optic acts as one pixel. I would also very quickly sketch a diagram. So I would write this. Light travels along the fiber optic by total internal reflection. This is because the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. Each fiber optic in the bundle, each fiber optic in the bundle transmits light from one pixel on the image. So the bundle of fiber optics need to be in the same orientation at the start and end of the bundle to produce a clear image. The speed of light in air is approximately 3 times 10 to the 8. State how the speed of light changes in optical fibres. Well, of course, you can't go faster than the speed of light. The speed of light decreases. The glass used in optical fibres has a refractive index of 1.495. Notice this time they've given you four significant figures, so don't round up too early. Calculate the critical angle of the glass used in optical fibres. Use the equation sine of C is 1 over N show you're working. So first of all, we need to put our values in. So sine of C is 1 over 1.495. And that's equal to 0.66896. I would quote it to five significant figures because we're given four already. Now, of course, to then find C, you have to do the inverse of sine. So on your calculator, find the sign button and then press shift and that sign button and that will give you the inverse sine to the minus one. And we're going to find out sine to the minus one of that value to find the angle. And that gives you 42.00 degrees. You could skip this step if you're confident and just write C is sine to the minus 1 of 1 over 1.495. Do that on your calculator and that gives you 41.98 degrees, which of course is very close. And the mark scheme has anything rounded up, up to four, that can be rounded up to 42. A diffraction experiment makes use of coherent light waves explain what is meant by coherent light and it is worth two marks so the first thing is the light has a constant phase difference now you can say the light is in phase that will give you the mark as well but the strict definition is it has a constant phase difference of course that will only give us one mark so what else is coherent light well of course it's the same frequency or wavelength. Either of those would do. So this is the six mark question. It says a technician wants to identify the gas in a discharge tube. The technician uses diffraction grating to produce emission spectra for the gas. Each spectra consists of a series of light and dark lines on the screen. Explain how the diffraction grating produces light and dark lines on the screen. You may draw diagrams to support your answer. The first key thing with diffraction gratings is make sure that you have at some point written this key, these two key ideas. The first is that bright lines are produced when light from neighboring slits arrives in phase because the path difference is one whole wavelength so they constructively interfere and the dark lines are produced where the light from adjacent or neighboring slits 
arrives out of phase by half a wavelength and so destructively interferes. As well as that, you're going to get more marks for explaining what happens to light when it goes through the slits. It spreads out, it diffracts, and each slit acts as a coherent source of light. And of course, where they, the light overlaps, you get interference and therefore the light and dark lines. And finally, we know the emission spectra is going to give off particular wavelengths of light so we can identify it. And so the wavelengths of light are split up and the larger the wavelength, the greater the angle that that light line, that colored line is produced. So how would I write this down in an exam question? So the first thing I'll do is to draw two separate diagrams to help me explain what is happening. These are the wave fronts going to diffraction grating and when the waves pass through diffraction grating you can see they spread out, they diffract and overlap and that's where interference takes place. I'm going to label that one. The examiner will clearly see what you've drawn. The second one is to help explain the path difference. So if I've got two slits here and I've got um, uh, my bright light here, so my bright line there, then of course that's one path that the light can take. That's the path taken by the neighboring uh, slit. And of course the path difference there for them to that be bright light is one wavelength and I can label that two and explain that in words in a minute. So first thing is I'm going to just talk briefly about the wavelength being split up um, when they pass through the diffraction grating into their separate colors um, and the bigger wavelength is produced at a larger angle so it's separating the spectrum up. Remember that all wavelengths produce a maxima at the center maximum, which is the same color as the gas. Different wavelengths colors are shown as different spectral lines. The bigger the wavelength, the greater the angle at which the line is produced. This splits the light up into its individual wavelengths, so the gas can be identified. All wavelengths produce a central maxima, which is the same colour as the excited gas. Now I've explained that, the next thing is, is to get that key information across about why bright lines are produced and why dark lines are produced. How the grating works. Light passes through each slit and diffracts. Each slit acts as a coherent source of light which is shown in diagram one. Where the light from each slit overlaps, interference occurs. Bright lines are produced when light from neighboring adjacent slits arrives in phase and constructively interferes. As the path difference is one wavelength, dark lines are produced when light from neighboring slits arrives out of phase and destructively interferes as the path difference is half a wavelength.